Welcome back. It's now the 14th lecture of the condensed matter course. Uh, more or less, we finished talking about scattering. Uh, there's a couple of little bits and pieces of scattering that I'm going to try to pick up later, maybe at the end of some other lectures. Instead, I'd like to move on and use what we've learned when we studied scattering in order to go back and study other types of waves in crystals. The type of waves we were interested in originally were electron waves and vibrational waves, or phonons. So let me remind you of a few things we had learned about electron waves in one dimension, and then we're going to try to generalize up to higher dimensions from what we've learned. So let's uh, recall the tight binding model. Tight binding model for electrons, binding model in 1D. In 1D, and we're going to consider the case of two orbitals with two orbitals per unit cell. Orbs per unit cell. And that can be uh, two atoms, one orbital on each atom. Or it could be two orbitals on the same atom, uh, one atom per unit cell. And we can, we can draw the dispersion in reduced zone scheme. Here's k, here's energy, uh, here's pi over a, here's minus pi over a. That's the bronze zone, the bz for bronze zone. We can write, draw the dispersion kind of like this. And like this, two modes uh, at each wave vector k in the bronze zone. Or we can unfold that picture in the extended zone scheme, looking like this. Here's k. Um, here's pi over a. Here's minus pi over a. Here's 2 pi over a. And here's minus 2 pi over a. So we have the same picture for the first mode. And then for the second mode, we're going to shift things over, shift the thing on the left over to the right by 2 pi over a to make it look like this, and shift the piece on the right over by 2 pi over a to the left to make it look like this. So we have what we call the first bronze zone here, first bronze zone, bz, here. And then these pieces here were the second bronze zone, second. Bronze zone, BZ. And so it's useful, there's k equals 0 right in the middle. It's useful to try to generalize this concept to three dimensions or, or higher dimensions. So let's, uh, let's do that. So generally, the Bruan zone, Bruan zone, since we're thinking about electrons in three dimensions, is going to be always defined as the unit cell in reciprocal space. And we're going to have to figure out what we mean by first bronze zone, second bronze zone, and so forth. So it's a general nth bronze zone, general, general nth bronze zone. We define as follows. So we'll start with the first bronze zone. Points in K space that are closer to, that are closer to, that are closer to k equals 0, k equals 0, then to any other, any other reciprocal lattice point, recip lat point are the first bronze zone. Are the first bronze zone, first BZ. So all these points in the first bronze zone are closer to the point at k equals 0 than to the other reciprocal lattice points. Here's a reciprocal lattice point here at 2 minus 2 pi over a. Here's another reciprocal lattice point here at 2 pi over a. And everything between minus pi over a and pi over a constitutes the first bronze zone because it's closer to k equals 0 than it is to any other reciprocal lattice point. This definition might look a little familiar to you, because in fact, it's the same definition as the wigner seitz cell. So this equals the wigner seitz cell, seitz cell of the k equals 0 point of k equals 0 in reciprocal lattice, in reciprocal lattice. Does that sound familiar, I hope? All points that are closer to a given reciprocal lattice point than to any 
all points that are closer to a given lattice point than to any other lattice point constitute its wigner site cell. So all points that are closer to k equals 0 than to any other reciprocal lattice point constitute the wigner site cell of the k equals 0 point in reciprocal space. Good? Yes? OK, good. So how about the second Brun <laughs> zone? Points where k equals 0 is the second closest, is the second closest recip lat point. Lat point are the second Brown zone, are the second, second BZ. So for example, if we pick, pick a point here, x, call this point x, the first closest reciprocal lattice point to this point x is here. The second closest reciprocal lattice point to the point x is k equals 0. Therefore, this point x is in the second Brillon zone. Good? OK. That's the definition. So a couple of notes about these uh, definitions. First of all, one, uh, Brillon zone boundary to opposite, to opposite, opposite a BZ boundary is a reciprocal lattice vector, is a recip lat vector. Recip lat vec. Let's see. So here's a Brillouin zone boundary. It's the boundary between the first Brillouin zone and the second Brillouin zone, minus pi over A. Here's another one. It's the opposite one from minus pi over A is plus pi over A. Distance between them is 2 pi over A, which is indeed a reciprocal lattice vector. Similarly, here's a boundary between the second Brillouin zone, and out here actually would be the third Brillouin zone. And so it's a uh, Brillouin zone boundary. The distance from it to the opposite Brillouin zone boundary over here at plus 2 pi over a is 4 pi over a. And that is also a reciprocal lattice vector. That is generally a true statement. Okay? There's a similar, so 1a, sort of a, caveat, uh, a corollary of this, is that BZ boundaries or maybe, a, maybe it's not a corollary, but it's almost equivalent statement. BZ boundaries are points where absolute value of k equals absolute value of k plus g for some g, for some reciprocal lattice vector g. OK? So for example, um, you, would need, you need to have k and k plus g um, let's see, what is it? k and k, k plus g having the same magnitude for, k, for g being some reciprocal lattice vector. So if you take minus pi over a, you add a reciprocal lattice vector, 2 pi over a to it, you get plus pi over a. Those have the same magnitude, so you're on the Brillouin zone boundary. Similarly, you take minus 2 pi over a, you add a reciprocal lattice vector to it, 4 pi over a, you get to plus 2 pi over a. That has the same magnitude, so you're on a Brillouin zone boundary. Um, the second statement, which is important about Brillouin zones, is each BZ Brillouin zone has the same, the same area, or volume in three dimensions, same area, and, and represents, represents each K point, uh, each crystal momentum, each crystal wave vector, I guess, wave vector k once. That was our general idea of constructing the Brillouin zone in the first place, that every physically different wave is represented exactly once in the Brillouin zone. The second Brillouin zone is equivalent to the first Brillouin zone. We've just sort of moved the pieces around into different places. But each wave vector k is represented exactly once inside each Brillouin zone. Incidentally, is it, is it obvious from the second Brillouin zone that you would define the third Brillouin zone analogously, points where the uh, k equals 0 is the third closest reciprocal lattice point would be the third Brillouin zone. So you have the first, second, third. You can have as many Brillouin zones as you want. Um, the, final, the final statement, which is useful, I think this is a homework assignment on the third homework set, that uh, the number of k states, number of k states, we even proved this in lecture, uh, in each BZ, BZ equals the number of unit cells, unit cells 
in system, in system. Does that sound familiar? We proved this in one dimension. I think for homework, you're supposed to prove it in three dimensions. It is also generally a true statement. Um, so actually, let me do an example of this in two dimensions to make this more clear. Uh, so this, we're going to start with a square lattice in real space. The reciprocal lattice of a square lattice is also a square lattice. So I've drawn a square lattice. This is supposed to be a, the reciprocal lattice, so it's a square lattice again. I've colored some of the points differently just to make them easy to talk about. The point at k equals 0, I've colored black in the center. And so first, we're going to try to construct the first Brawn zone. That is the Wigner site cell of this black point in the center. So how do you construct the Wigner site cell? You put down perpendicular bisectors to the nearest points. Perpendicular bisectors to the red points here will make this point. That's a perpendicular bisector here. Then this, this plane, this perpendicular bisector, these two also giving all the perpendicular bisectors to the red points. And then you color in the area. That is the first Brawn zone. OK? Now, the distance across the first Brawn zone is 2 pi over a, which is a reciprocal lattice vector the way it's supposed to be. That distance there from perpendicular bisector to perpendicular bisector is a reciprocal lattice vector. Now, let's look for the second Brawn zone. How do we do that? It's a very similar construction. You just start putting down more perpendicular bisectors. So here, the second closest sets of points are these blue points here. So let's put down perpendicular bisectors to those, like this. Like this, like this, like this. So these are the perpendicular bisectors to the blue points out here. We'll color in the walled off area blue. And this is now the second Brawn zone. Now let's just check that it fits the definition. If you pick a point like here in the second Brawn zone, the first closest reciprocal lattice point is this red point here. The second closest reciprocal lattice point is k equals 0. Therefore, this point here, somewhere in this blue region, is in the second Brawn zone. Good? OK. Now, it may not be obvious that the distance across the Brawn zone from Brawn zone boundary to Brawn zone boundary here is a reciprocal lattice vector, but I'll show you that it is. This is a reciprocal lattice vector from 0 to the blue point. If you just shift it like that, it's indeed the distance across from Brawn zone boundary to Brawn zone boundary. So we can keep going on, looking for the third Brawn zone. And to construct the third Brawn zone, we have to take, put perpendicular bisectors to these green points. So let's do that. Put down those green lines, which are perpendicular bisectors to the green points. And we fill in the area now green. And let's check that it satisfies the definition. If you pick a point here in the green area, the first closest reciprocal lattice point is this red point here. The second closest is the blue point out here. The third closest is the k equals 0 point in the center. So this is in the third Brawn zone. Now, um, also, the distance from Brawn zone boundary to Brawn zone boundary across the system is 4 pi over a, which is also a reciprocal lattice vector. Now, another thing that you've been promised from these definitions is that each Brawn zone has the same area, it looks like they kind of might, and that they should each represent each k point once. So the Brawn zones represent every possible k point exactly once. To see this, what we're going to do is we're going to take the pieces of this puzzle and with some very crude animation, we're going to move them by reciprocal lattice vectors and show that they're actually the same shape. So let's see how that works. So I'm going to take this red section, the first Brawn zone, and I'm going to get that exact same shape of the first Brawn zone, same area, same shape, uh, exactly, by moving these pieces of the second Brawn zone over. So this piece I'm going to move by a reciprocal lattice vector, like that, 2 pi over a over. Then I'll take this piece, I'll move it 2 pi over a over this way. And I'll take the top piece, move it 2 pi over a down, and the other one 2 pi over a up, and it fills exactly the first Brawn zone. So, well, OK, my animation skills are not, not perfect. Wait till you see the other one, it's even worse. Um, but, uh, but you get the picture that it's supposed to fill the, the first Brawn zone exactly once. And we didn't, by shifting things by 2 pi over a, we actually didn't change the waves at all. Because if you shift by 2 pi over a, you're getting back exactly the same crystal momentum, the same physical wave by doing this. So the second Brawn zone is effectively exactly equivalent to the first Brawn zone. Now let's do the same thing for the third Brawn zone. We'll shift this over by 2 pi over a, this over by 2 pi over a. OK, now it's really going to get bad. But, um, but you get the idea that it's supposed, to, it's supposed to fit perfectly. And had I been better with my animation skills, it, it would have fit perfectly. OK, so that's the general, general idea of, of Brawn zones. Just a couple facts about Brawn zones in 3D. So in 3D, 
The lattices that we're interested in, let's write down a list of the lattices we're interested in, or mainly interested in, in we have simple cubic, simple cubic, we have BCC, and we have FCC. So the re corresponding reciprocal lattices, recip lat, is, well, a simple cubic lattice has a, has a reciprocal lattice, which is also simple cubic. The BCC lattice, this is something I mentioned, and I think it's a revision homework problem. The reciprocal lattice of a BCC lattice is FCC, and the reciprocal lattice of an FCC lattice is BCC. So the shape of the first boron zone, first BZ shape, is, well, for a simple cubic lattice, the Wigner site cell is a cube. So the first um, boron zone for the simple cubic lattice is a cube. For the BCC lattice, the reciprocal lattice is FCC. So we get something that's the shape of the Wigner site cell for FCC, which was a funny shape. It was a truncated octahedron. I'll show you a picture in a second. And for FCC lattice, the reciprocal lattice is BCC. And so you get the Wigner site cell uh, for uh, BCC here. Um, actually, I may have said this, this one is the truncated octahedron. No, this one's the truncated octahedron, and this is the, let me just show it on the slide. <laughs> OK. So this is the first bronze zone of an FCC lattice. This one's the trunc this one's a truncated octahedron. This one's uh, the truncated the, uh, dodecahedron. It's, this one has 12 sides. This one has 14 sides. All right, whatever. Um, these are the shapes of the, um, of the, of the bronze zone. So in this case, the FCC lattice has a reciprocal lattice, which is BCC. And this is the Wigner site cell of the BCC lattice. And this is the Wigner site cell of the FCC lattice, which is also the first boron zone of the BCC lattice. Now, you'll notice that these pictures are drawn in K space, KX, KY, and KZ. And you'll also notice that um, there are some letters dropped onto these pictures. These letters are there because people typically, when they describe points on, in the boron zone, they usually say, we're talking about the gamma point, or the x point, or the l point. And that's just a shorthand nomenclature that you don't need to know. But it's worth knowing that they have these, when they say x point, they mean some particular point in the Brown zone. So the point in the middle of a square face is called the x point, this point, this point, or this point. The point in the middle of one of the hexagonal faces is called the l point. The point in the center is always called gamma. You don't need to know these things. All right. so. Now that we, we've con we have these pictures of the Brown zone for, um, you know, for our various lattices, we can start thinking about the excitation spectra, either the electronic excitation spectra or the phonon excitation spectra, for various different crystals. And so everywhere in the Brown zone, there will be different, like in the reduced zone scheme, you'll have different excitation modes at each possible value of k in the, in the Brown zone. So let's, uh, let's do an example. Being that it's Valentine's Day, happy Valentine's Day, everyone, is we're going to do diamond. If, uh, all right. Um, so, um, well, we do diamond every year, so it just happens to be a Valentine's Day this year. Um, so, diamond, you'll recall, is an FCC lattice with a two atom basis, one carbon at 0, 0, 0, and one carbon at 1 quarter, 1 quarter, 1 quarter. This is the shape of the bronze zone, as we had on the previous slide. Now, the first question, and opportunities to win chocolate, how many phonon modes should there be at each k vector in the first boron zone? How many phonon modes? One. No. Three. No, no. <laughs> no. Oh my gosh. So there's, there's two atoms in the print. I'm going to eat this one myself. All right. <laughs> I'm going to gain weight this year. Um, no, there's two atoms in the primitive unit cell. Each atom can move in three possible directions. So that means you have six modes. Yeah. So let's see if we have a picture of it. Yeah. So here's a, here's a picture of the diamond phonon spectrum. Um, so the way it's drawn is that you take cuts through the Brown zone along certain directions that you're interested in. So for example, this line, so here's the frequency vertical, and then the k vector is horizontal, but you, it's given to you in a cut. So this is cutting from gamma to x along the 1, 0, 0 direction gamma to x along 1, 0, 0 direction along this side of the line here. And then you know, from here to here is gamma to L along the 1, 1, 1 direction from here to here along that dotted line. This one's a little more complicated. It's x to gamma along the 1, 1, 0 direction. So that actually goes from this x through this k 
into the ga gamma in the center of the next Brown zone over. So that one's a little complicated, but all right. Now, you'll notice that if you pick a point in the center here, you will count exactly six modes. One, two, three, four, five, six. If you count over here, you'll discover there's only four modes. Um, why is that? Well, the reason is because two of them are degenerate. You'll see these two modes coming in to this point here, and then they have the same energy all the way down from here to here, and then two modes here are degenerate up here, and they have the same energy uh, or same frequency all the way over here. And the reason for the degeneracy is because it, you're looking along a particularly symmetric direction where vibrations transverse in this direction and vibrations transverse in that direction look identical. Whereas along this direction, it's a very unsymmetric direction, so all directions of vibration actually have different energies. You can see a couple of interesting things in this, in this figure. The gamma point is k equals zero. You can see the acoustic modes coming down to, uh, to, to k equals zero linearly. And these are the optical modes up here at, at high frequency. And uh, one of these modes is longitudinal. Two of them are transverse. Now, we can ask the same questions about an electronic excitation spectrum. And when you, when you calculate an electronic excitation spectrum in, say, tight binding approximation, you have to decide how many orbitals you're going to consider on each, uh, on each atom. So for example, in that picture up there, we considered two orbitals per unit cell. So given that, um, a typical uh, type of calculation for carbon, you don't want to keep all the orbitals out to infinity. So generally, you just keep the orbitals you're interested in. What one is usually interested in is the orbitals where there's some, some sort of interesting action going on. The, 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 one, the one orbitals, those are core orbitals. They're just completely filled, nothing interesting going on there. The orbitals that are 3, 3s, 3p, and so forth, those are just completely empty, totally uninteresting. The ones that are interesting are the ones that are sort of partially filled, partially empty. Those are the 2s and the 3, 2p orbitals. So given that we're considering the 3s and the, and the 3, 2p orbitals, how many excitation modes, eigenvalues, should we find at each k point in the Brown zone? One more chance. We're considering four orbitals per atom. What was the answer? Eight. Did you say eight? Yeah, OK. So, oh, oh almost there, got there. All right, eight. Yeah, so there's two orbitals per. If you count, what you, you need to do is you need to count the total number of orbitals per primitive unit cell, and that will give you the total number of excitation modes per, um, uh, per k vector. Now, this diagram, this is an excitation spectrum, an electronic excitation spectrum of diamond. These things are frequently known as spaghetti diagrams for obvious reasons, because it looks like some sort of complicated bowl of spaghetti that you can't make any sense of. But, um, but it's actually, it's, it's fairly simple. It, it, well, not that, not that complicated. What's, again, you're looking at cuts through the Brown zone. So this is a line between the L and gamma point along this lot dotted line. This is a line from gamma to x along this dotted line, then x to k, k to gamma. So it's basically just taking cuts through the Brown zone. And at each k point, there are eight modes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And some, in some directions, it looks like there's only six. Uh, let's see, for example, this direction, one, two, three, four, five, six, because two of them have become degenerate here. See, these two came together. Oh, no, hang on. These two came together here to make only one. That's because there's actually two modes with the same energy, so you have to be a little bit careful about that. Um, uh, for, now, carbon has a valence of four, which means each carbon donates four electrons. And that means with two carbons per primitive unit cell, we have donated eight electrons total. So you fill the bottom four bands with both spins. So the bottom four bands are filled. Then there's a gap, and you have the upper four bands. And in fact, as we'll discuss in a couple lectures later on, that means what we have is we have a really good insulator, filled bands, then a big gap, and then a bunch of empty bands. It's also what makes diamond nice and transparent. So it makes diamond beautiful, appropriately enough for Valentine's Day. All right. So Let's move on from here. I think that's enough of diamond for today. Um, so one of the things that's fairly important about this, this story is that with our tight binding spectra, we always have the principle that if you take k to some k plus g, you get back um, exactly the same wave. And you have the same principle for vibrations as well. Now, you might ask whether this uh, the principle that if when you shift k by a reciprocal lattice vector, whether that is actually special to the tight binding approximation we used, or whether this is actually a general statement. Let's remind ourselves why it is that we found this for an exit for a, 
uh, for a tight binding model. Basically, the tight binding wave function, this is in a slightly different language than I wrote it before, but you can, you can write it as e to the i k dot r times uh, electron sitting on lattice point r. This is, this, we used to call this thing phi, and we gave this a, uh, no, I think it's more or less. I guess the difference is now we're doing it in three dimensions rather than one dimension. That's why it looks a little different. But this is basically the tight binding wave function that we wrote down uh, before. And this thing is obviously invariant under taking k to k plus g because e to the i k, oops, e to the i g dot r, when you shift k by g, e to the i g dot r equals 1 because g is in the reciprocal lattice and r is in the direct lattice. So if k gets shifted by g, it doesn't change this factor here and you get back the same wave. So, but you might ask whether this is just a property of the tight binding model or if this is actually something that's general. And this is actually a really important question and it's a question that came up um, very shortly after the discovery of the Schrodinger equation. Schrodinger discovered his equation in 1926. In 1928, that people were already worried about this issue. And it was resolved very famously by Bloch, Felix Bloch, in what's known as Bloch's theorem. Um, Bloch's theorem, all right, uh, OK, um, which is frequently referred to as the underpinning of all of material science. It's an underpinning of all of semiconductor physics. It's an extremely important principle, which may not seem so important until we talk about some of its implications. But let me state the theorem first, then we'll prove the theorem, then we'll talk about some of the implications. So the statement is, an electron in a periodic potential, in periodic potential, potential periodic V of R, I guess periodic means V of R equals V of R, plus V of capital R, with capital R being a lattice vector, uh, has eigenstates of the form, has eigenstates of the form Okay, there's a lot of symbols here for a second. Psi sub k of r equals uh, e to the i k dot r times u superscript alpha sub k of r, where, where u is periodic. So it's the same if you shift it from u, u of r equals u of r plus r. And k's and k's can be chosen in the first Brillouin zone, can be chosen in first Brillouin zone. In other words, k is crystal momentum. k is crystal wave vector, crystal wave vector. Um, this form is known as, uh, this form of psi, of psi, is known as a modified plane wave, is known as, as a modified plane wave, a modified plane wave, modified plane wave, that, um, that should be fairly obvious. It's a plane wave, e to the i k dot r, and is mo modified by being multiplied by a periodic function, u. That's the modification of the plane wave. Um, the index alpha, alpha is the band index. And the band index is meant to describe, you know, you get a different wave function if you're talking about this point here or this point here at the same k vector at the you know, same k vector, you can have more than one eigenstate. So the energies, eigenenergies, are uh, E superscript alpha of k. So E1 and E2, depending on which, uh, um, which uh, band we're talking about, which, which, which energy level, the lowest or the next lowest or the next, next lowest, and so forth. OK, so this is a, a pretty big uh, bunch of statements we've made here. But it's fairly important because it tells you about 
the general structure of eigenstates in a periodic potential. So let's first prove this uh, theorem, and then we'll talk about why this theorem is so important and why it underlies so much of material science and semiconductor physics and so forth. So first, OK, so this is sort of a quasi-proof. It's actually fairly rigorous, but we'll, um, we'll sort of not fill in the details. But the quasi-proof goes like, like this. First, we'll consider a Hamiltonian, which is H0, just the free electron Hamiltonian, plus our potential V, which is periodic. So V is periodic. And H0 is the usual P squared over 2M. Um, now, if we threw away the periodic potential, we would know the eigenstates. Those are just plane wave eigenstates, plane waves, uh, E0, K, K where e naught, e naught of k is just the h bar squared k squared over 2m that we usually have. So, so far so good. We know we have the plane waves. Then we have to add the periodic potential. Now, what can the periodic potential do? The periodic potential can scatter you from some k to some k prime via a matrix element of this form. Now, we know a lot about matrix elements of this form from what we learned in scattering theory. This thing here, this matrix element from a plane wave k to a plane wave k prime via a periodic potential v is the Fourier transform, Fourier transform of v of r, evaluated at uh, k minus k prime. And that is the following. It is 0 uh, if k minus k prime, k minus k prime is not a reciprocal lattice vector is not equal to g. And we'll call it v sub g if uh, k minus k prime equals g. Uh, I'm going to call it k prime minus k equals g. That. Um, and this is just Lowy's condition that you can scatter from a wave vector k to a wave vector k prime only if the difference between k and k prime is a reciprocal lattice vector. We learned this when we studied scattering of x-rays and neutrons and so forth. So this gets us almost to the proof. So we can almost conclude the result here. Why? Well, the point here is that the Hamiltonian with the scattering potential is block diagonal, no, no pun intended, um, block diagonal, block with a k, diagonal. And what I mean by this is that you can scatter from k to a k prime if k and k prime are separated by g. And then from k prime, you can scatter to another k double prime if those are separated by a g. And you can scatter to another k prime, and so forth, and so on, and so forth. But you can never change the crystal momentum. All of the k's that you can get to by scattering by the, via the periodic potential, all of them differ from each other by reciprocal lattice vectors. So the Hamiltonian breaks up in if you, into these sectors, if you like. And so the wave function must be of the form, psi k must be of the form, sum over g of some coefficients, let's call them a of g plus k, um, times e to the i k plus g dotted with r. Now, why should it have to be of this form? Well, you start with some e to the i k dot r. And then you mix into that, the Hamiltonian mixes into that um, different plane waves whose wave vector k differs by a reciprocal or lattice vector g. And you can mix in as many of those as you want, and they all get some coefficients a. But at the end of the day, the wave function must be a sum only of things that have the same crystal momentum, k plus some reciprocal lattice vector g. There's no way the periodic potential can, take you, can change your crystal momentum. That's the important realization. Good? Yeah? Happy? Good. All right. So from here, we're pretty much done, because you can just factor out the e to the i k dot r, and then you have sum over g of uh, a of g plus k, e to the i uh, g dot r. And this piece here is the, is the periodic function u, um, u of r, which, and you can tell this thing must be periodic, because if you take e to the i uh, g, g dotted with r plus r, move it by a, a direct space lattice vector, this thing is the same as e to the i k dot r. So this thing is periodic, as, as claimed. OK. Um, furthermore, we can also check 
what happens if you take k and you shift it by a reciprocal lattice vector g. So let's, let's actually take this form of k up here. And let's shift k by g, psi of k plus g. Uh, actually, I've already used the letter g, so let's call this uh, g prime. Shift it by k to k plus g prime. So we'll write it as sum over g, uh, a sub g plus k plus g prime, uh, e to the i uh, k plus g prime plus g. But this sum is over a dummy index. So we can define a dummy index. Uh, let's call it g twiddle equals uh, g, g twiddle vector equals g plus g prime vector. And then if you substitute that in, that becomes sum over g twiddle vector a of g twiddle vector plus k uh, e to the i k, oops, dot r, k plus g twiddle vector dot r, which is exactly the same expression that we started with up, up there. So if you shift k by a reciprocal lattice vector g, you get back exactly the same wave function, which was what we were trying to answer in the first place. Is it special that when you shift k by a reciprocal lattice vector, you get back ex the exactly the same wave function? Is that special to the tight binding model? It's not. It's a property of the Schrodinger equation and the periodic potential. Okay. All right. So the implications of this uh, theorem, which is viewed as so important, is one implications. One, uh, an excitation. Uh, all excitations can be described. All excitations can be described, be described in one Brillouin zone, in one BZ. Because whenever you go outside of the Brillouin zone, you can just shift by a reciprocal lattice vector to get back into the first, uh, back into that Brillouin zone. Um, so that's an important statement. Second important statement, maybe more important, is that a uh, periodic potential, a periodic potential does not change, does not scatter crystal momentum. And this is something that I mentioned before when we discussed the type binding model that the crystal momentum is conserved. Um, the crystal momentum is always conserved. And the fact that we have this very strong periodic potential doesn't ruin that. This, the reason this is so important, remember we had this puzzle when we studied the Sommerfeld model, that you have this mean free path of electrons, which is enormously long, hundreds of atoms or thousands of atoms long. And we couldn't understand it because there's a big nucleus that the atom can hit every you know, few angstroms. It could scatter off of tons and tons of nuclei. The point here is that the, it, you don't have pure plane waves. What you have is modified plane waves. You have these plane waves times a periodic function. But once you modify the plane wave by multiplying it by this periodic function, then it's perfectly good plane wave to go all the way across the system without scattering at all. So if you take a, you know, an electron, you put it in a little wave packet of this modified plane wave, it would travel clear across the system as long as it doesn't hit any impurities or, or nasty things like that. But it could go um, all the way across the system without scattering at all. So this sort of resolves our, our initial issue of why it is that electrons can travel so far without, without scattering. OK. And where did this, this result come from? It's important to realize that this important result really came from Lowy's condition. It came from the fact that a periodic potential only scatters you by reciprocal wave vectors. All right. So the one thing that this doesn't do for us is it does not manage to uh, it does not ha manage to help us actually solve the Schrodinger equation. So solving, solving Schrodinger equation is still hard. Um, and we've already discussed one way to do it. One way to do it is uh, tight binding. And by tight binding, what we're really doing is we start with, start with atomic orbitals, with atomic orbitals. And allow weak hopping, allow weak hopping. But that might sound a little uh, non-generic, because maybe the hopping is strong be from one place to another. So 
it's useful to, it's actually very useful to think about it from a very complementary viewpoint, where instead of starting with a tight binding model, we start with plane waves. Start with, with plane waves. Plane waves. And add weak periodic potential. V of R. So it's entirely the opposite way of looking at things. This approach, approach two, uh, two is known as the nearly free electron model. Nearly free electron model. And it's a very useful model for understanding a lot of the physics of, of semiconductors and band structure in, in solids. So let's, let's go about that. Let's start it. We probably won't finish it today. But the, uh, so how do we do this? We start with our uh, H0 on K, our plane waves, without the periodic potential. So E0K on K, where uh, E0 is the usual h bar squared K squared over 2m. It's a good place to start. And then let's assume V is weak. Assume weak V. All right, so what do you do when you have a weak perturbation to a Hamiltonian? Well, you use perturbation theory, which you presumably learned last year. So you remember what happens to the energies in perturbation theory. So let's start with first order perturbation theory. First order, order, pert. The energy, this will probably look familiar, the energy of the wave, the eigenstate k, is the bare energy without the perturbation plus the first order perturbation theor theory term, which is k v k. And this matrix element here, um, well, I scrolled it off the top of the board. Uh, no, maybe I didn't. Maybe I did. I think I did. Um, we defined it as v sub 0 because k minus k is 0. And this v sub 0 is the same, same for all k, for all k. So this just gives an overall constant energy shift of the, the eigenstates. So the, the eigenstates either get shifted up in energy or they get shifted down in energy. This is sort of the, the zeroth Fourier mode of this potential. It's whatever constant potential is added on top of any uh, fluctuating potentials, things that change in space. So the zeroth Fourier mode of the, of the potential just shifts up and down the overall energy of k. Does this expression look familiar, first order probation theory? You just take the exponential? Yeah, OK. Good. So this is not interesting. And as a matter of fact, people frequently drop v0 because it's so uninteresting they just get rid of it. I'll try to keep it, but maybe I'll forget it by mistake at some point. So second order is more interesting. So at second order, you have ek equals ek0. That's the bare piece plus v0, that's the first order piece. And then you have the second order piece, which is sum of k prime not equal to k. Then we have k prime v k squared over e sub k naught minus e k prime naught. Is that the right order? Yeah. Does that look familiar from second order perturbation theory? Good. All right. Now, what do we know about this second order term? Well, again, we have Lowy's condition for the upstairs matrix element, that in order for that matrix element to be non-zero, you must have k prime minus k must equal a reciprocal lattice vector g. So this term here can be rewritten as sum over g of reciprocal lattice vectors g of v sub g squared, where g is k prime minus k, divided by e sub k naught minus e sub k plus g naught. Good? Look happy with that somewhat? OK. So this is our expression for the second order shift in energy of the plane waves that we started with. But we have to be a little bit careful about expressions that look like this. And the reason we have to be careful is because you might have a situation where the two terms in the denominator are either equal to each other, in which case you get 0 downstairs, or very close to each other, in which case you get something very small downstairs. And in either case, the second order term would blow up, in which case you have a divergence. And that means the second order perturbation theory is not correct. Um, so you must uh, be careful, be 
careful when e sub k, let's just write it as e sub k naught is approximately equal to e sub k plus g naught. Now, when does that happen? Well, e sub k is actually just proportional to k squared. So that will happen when absolute k equals absolute k plus g. Well, what, where's that? You'll remember somewhere here, there it is. It's the condition for being on a Brouhan zone boundary. When you're on a Brouhan zone boundary, e sub k and e sub k plus g are actually the same. Let's actually draw a picture of that. So what we have is we have a, um, this is our bare spectrum, k and e. The bare spectrum is just a parabola. So this is e sub k is h bar squared not k squared over 2m. And here's pi over a. Here's uh, minus pi over a. And the energy of these two, these are separated by a reciprocal lattice vector, 2 pi over a. And their energy is identical. So this would give us a divergence in second order perturbation theory. Similarly, if we go to uh, minus 2 pi over a and 2 pi over a, um, these are separated by a reciprocal lattice vector, 4 pi over a, and their energies are identical. So they will give you a divergence in second order perturbation theory. So the place where second order perturbation theory fails is exactly when um, you're on a Brouhan zone boundary. So what we're going to need to do is we are going to need to, uh, we're probably going to have to do this next time, but what we're going to do to fix this problem, fix problem by using, using degenerate perturbation theory. Degenerate perturbation theory, pert theory, which hopefully you've learned something about already. Um, so we're not going to have time to launch into that today. So I'm going to actually take the opportunity to insert one piece of information or maybe two pieces of information about scattering that I promised you we would talk about sometime. And that is scattering off of, so maybe I'll put that over here, scattering off of um, x-rays and neutron scatterings. X-ray and neutron scattering. This is a different subject, just inserted in this last five minutes. Neutron scattering from, from liquids, liquids and amorphous solids, amorphous solids. So in liquids and amorphous solids, we do not have periodic structures. We do not have periodic arrangement of atoms. But nonetheless, you get a lot of information out of the neutron and x-ray scattering. If you think way back to when we did Fermi's golden rule, that the scattering amplitude is still the Fourier transform of the periodic uh, of the potential, but it's not a periodic potential. It's a Fourier transform of the non-periodic potential. But does that mean there's no information in it? No, there's still information in it. It's just that you don't get sharp peaks anymore. What you get is, here, there it is. So this is x-ray scattering on uh, liquid aluminum. It's heated up to some high temperature, so it's, so it's a liquid. And as a function of the scattering angle, or the uh, reciprocal wave vector, that's, uh, the, the wave vector, um, along this axis, the amplitude of scattering is, has peaks. And the peaks represent roughly the distance between, uh, between atoms. It's one over the distance between atoms, the same way the peaks represent the, uh, the periodicity of the unit cell when it becomes crystalline. Now what happens is as you cool down a liquid and it gets more and more crystalline, there becomes more and more local order, and these peaks get sharper and sharper and sharper. And finally, when the thing actually crystallizes, they become you know, delta function peaks, the way we expected them to for, for a crystal. But if it's a liquid, it's sort of, you, you can sort of think of a liquid as locally being like a solid. You know, each atom has a couple neighbors, but if you sort of look farther away, it's not ordered anymore. It sort of loses its order. But if you sort of look just in some small region, it probably has, you know, it's organized over a small region. So you get these sort of broad peaks in, in the scattering uh, spectrum. Um, OK, I think maybe I won't try to cover any further uh, uh, issues today. And we'll start again on Wednesday, I think. Have a good weekend.